In the Groundhog Day meets Saving Private Ryan action film, Edge of Tomorrow, the design of the film's antagonists, the Mimics, posed a very unique design challenge. These creatures had to be so dangerous that the only way to overcome them was to literally reset time over and over again until you can finally beat them. But at the same time, they had the limitation that they couldn't be so deadly that they were completely unkillable. And so, to achieve this, I believe that the filmmakers leveraged the power of the unknown and made the mimics into the most alien aliens in all of cinema. From the way that they moved, to the way they look, to the way they fight, even to the way they sound. Because when something as deadly as a mimic is a complete unknown in all aspects, then its biggest weakness is going to be trying again and again to defeat them, and thus slowly uncovering all of those unknowns. So that's why in this video, we're going to explore exactly what the filmmakers did to make these creatures so unique and so deadly, whilst also asking why other films don't do this, and then use all of this as an avenue to explore how the film masterfully tied this power of the unknown into the film's narrative. So let's dive into this movie that literally no one saw, but yet remains one of the coolest and most creative films of the last decade. So yeah, I think a lot of this unknown quantity comes from that first opening battle, because for much of it, the audience never actually gets to see who or what the soldiers are fighting. Instead, all we're exposed to is chaos, death, and scores of javelin-like missiles that go screeching overhead. And by keeping the threat obscured like this, it had two brilliant effects on the audience. The first is that it allows us to identify with the disoriented main character, Cage, and attain that same level of chaos and confusion that he feels as he's been unwillingly thrust into this battle. But at the same time, it also allows the audience's imagination to begin to form their own image as to what this alien menace actually looks like. And so when they're finally revealed to us towards the end of this battle, director Doug Lyman wanted them to exceed anything we could possibly have imagined, having them look deadly to the touch whilst also having them be truly alien in nature, and thus instilling the audience with that same sense of fear and unknown that Cage feels upon first seeing them. And so to achieve such a unique design, the artists behind these creatures needed to break as far away as possible from the standard way that we tend to create sci-fi. And that was by not filtering these creatures' appearances through our human perception of the world. Because you see, usually when we design alien worlds, creatures, or tech, they're almost always, to some degree, funneled through our understanding of reality. And so this can manifest in very overt ways, such as giving the creatures mammal-esque features, like eyes, a nose, or a mouth. But it can also manifest in much more subtle ways, like how the creature stands, whether they're a biped, a quadruped, insect-like, or slug-like, to what their exterior is like. Maybe they'll have skin, or perhaps they'll be furry, or have a hard shell. Or to how they move, maybe they'll scuttle around, or fly, or sprint. All of these design choices tie in somehow with how our minds perceive reality. And you can always draw that line between something we can comprehend on this planet and these creatures. It's kind of like that whole thing that no sci-fi movie from back in the day ever predicted the smartphone. Because back in the 1970s, tech like an iPhone just wasn't in the writer's frame of reference for the world or their perceptions of the future, so they could never have predicted the tech and put it into the movie. But now, I'm making this familiarity to our world sound like a bit of a bad thing. But this is absolutely not the case. In fact, this familiarity is done on purpose, because in making elements of these creatures recognisable to us, it lets the human primal part of our brain project attributes onto them, and thus massively enhance the story. So for example, perhaps we'll perceive more threat in aggressive looking creatures, or emotionally connect better to creatures with more human looking features. Either way, it can trigger some kind of emotional response in us, and draw us deeper into the story. And on top of this, by taking the roots of your character's design from something that actually exists in reality, it helps keep the creature both grounded and believable. Because now, you can use reality as a baseline to figure out stuff like how the creature should move, or look, or its strength, or its weight, or what features it should have. And so this is where the designers actually realised they went a little bit too far with the designs of the mimics. Because in pursuit of distancing this creature from anything recognisable, they actually stripped away anything that the human brain could actually comprehend. Because basically, to make them more unique, they decided that these beings should be formed of individual, obsidian-coated, sharp, murderous tentacles, and that all of these tentacles should be interlinked to form a singular entity, but in a freeform way, and not in any kind of way that could be considered their body. Then they start to look a bit more squid-like, and thus a little less alien to us. And so, to visualise this, the artist went and built a little practical model demonstration of this free-formed interlinked tentacle design, and they put it down on the table, and they looked at it, and they realised that it just looked like a big blob of spaghetti. 
because without anything to bind all of these tentacles together, there was absolutely nothing that the human mind could cling onto and see coherent shapes in. And so this is where, at least visually, they had to scale back how alien these things are. And therefore they had to give them some kind of solid body where all of these tentacles were contained within, in addition to giving them sharp, untrustworthy facial features like squinty horrible eyes and a beak-shaped jaw that they could scream out of. And this worked in a way, because in doing this they tapped back into that human primal perception of seeing something with these kinds of features as a threat, but also in doing this they just stepped away from their goal of creating something that was a true unknown in its appearance. And so this meant that if they weren't going completely alien in the looks department, then they'd have to make up for this with how it moved. Because, again, these creatures had to be a threat, so they had to be fast and deadly, but at the same time this movement still had to be believable, and even though they now had a body, there was still no real reference in reality as to how a blob of tentacles could move around in any sort of threatening manner. Because to look at, you'd assume these things would just slug around like a slug, or maybe crawl like a giant spider, or perhaps float like those robots in the Matrix, all of which aren't really deadly enough to have to reset time to kill. And so the artists set about trying to find this magic bullet movement that was both believable but also an insane threat to humans and eventually they found themselves looking at this design here by SR Partners which was the perfect match because with this clip as a reference the animation team could transpose this wild kinetic movement onto the mimics and create this erratic yet physically correct looking movement. And on top of this, this kinetic baseline gave an opening for the artists to add a true degree of unpredictability to the mimics. Because now, for example, rather than having to turn around to face a target, the mimic's head could just fold through their body to face the other direction, and then their entire body could grow new limbs and adapt to this new orientation. Or they could just grow new limbs to create a random, unpredictable attack. And what I love about this is how this unpredictable movement makes the mimics the perfect enemy to fight against with a time reset mechanic. As the only way you can outmaneuver such a rapid enemy is if you know what's coming in the future. And so this kind of taps into that whole video game, learning the enemy's attack pattern and then waiting for an opening kind of thing, which is a brilliant yet subtle addition to how video game inspired this film is, and it really shows how much thought went into these creatures. So yeah, from an artistic perspective, this movement is great, but from a technical perspective, from the accolades we just listed, that it's unpredictable, that its shape can change at a moment's notice, it's made up of thousands of individual interweave tentacles, and that it does all of this at an insane speed, this kind of goes against every single thing that VFX eyes, and more importantly animators, want to work with. Because what animators want is something solid, and that has a completely consistent shape. Because underlying 99% of all digital characters is this thing called a rig. And this is basically the character's skeleton which animators can use to drive and deform the shape of the character. But to get this rig to work, a lot of effort has to go into setting it up, manually determining which areas should have control over others and how much these bones should deform the shapes around them. And this means that the character that this rig is linked to needs to be completely consistent in its shape. Because if that ever changes, even just a little bit, then you have to completely redetermine all of these properties all over again. And so if you have a creature like a Mimic, which is constantly changing its structure, either by growing a new limb or folding its head through its body, then every time it does this, you'd have to completely re-rig this character to set it up to work with its new shape, just to have the Mimic change shape five seconds later again and have to re-rig it all over again. So having something that's constantly changing its structure on the fly renders this type of workflow completely impossible. But more so than this, how are the animators supposed to animate these things in the first place? Look at them, they're an interweaved mess of tentacles upon tentacles, and trying to detangle these tentacles by hand so that you can animate them with your little underlying skeleton thing is just going to be impossible. And so this is where artist Dan Sheeran took the reins and devised an incredible system where you could automate as much of this animation as possible. He created a tool where instead of having to direct direct these thousands of tentacles themselves, all the animators would have to do is direct the movement of the one central core tentacle, then all the satellite tentacles surrounding it would adapt and move with it, and detangle themselves in the process. And then this tool also allowed the animators to increase each tentacle's width, length, or add a whole new tentacle, and this unlocked the ability to animate the Mimic's rapidly changing direction, because now they could completely reconfigure the Mimic's orientation by being able to change the appearance of every tentacle on the Mimic's body. And so with this, they could finally create those manic, kinetic animations like the ones we saw by SR Partners. But, once again, the VFX artists paid the price for choosing something so alien with this movement. Because, once they actually started inserting this movement into the film, it just didn't look at all realistic. Because their movement was so wild and kinetic, it caused them to just glide across the ground and look absolutely weightless in the scene. Which is the number one complaint about CGI, and the first thing that makes it stand out as something synthetic and icky. 
but they needed to be this fast and agile to remain frightening. And so this is where having a lot of this film be set on a beach turned out to be an amazing ally. Because the VFX artists found that by having the mimics kick up sand and dirt and debris as they flurried around made them look insanely more grounded in the shot. And so this is why in every mimic appearance in the film there's an insane amount of sand and dirt and debris being chucked around. And I think leveraging the sand in the scene is what really solidified the VFX as this believable thing. Not just with the CGI sand, but also with how many flipping practical effects they used as well. Because looking at the behind the scenes of this film makes it seem like a genuine war zone. There were so many extras running around, fires, explosions and chaos, and this really translates into the movie. And you get this genuine sense of danger because the actors are shuddering and reacting to real explosions going off around them. And all of this massively enhances the tension any time we're back on that beach. And this ties really well back into that whole fear of the unknown throughout those first few moments, and brilliantly immerses you into the film, and massively sells the mimics as this dangerous, intimidating, but also realistic threat. And so all of these different elements play so well with each other to create this believable yet fast and dangerous creature that sits right on the unknown of human perception. One that's so unique and so different and so unpredictable from anything we can comprehend on this planet and that the only possible way you can actually defeat them is to try again and again and again and again. So that is why, in all aspects, I believe that the mimics are the most alien aliens in all of sci-fi. So thank you for watching everyone, I really hope you enjoyed. Are there any other aliens or creatures that you think look more unique than the mimics? And were you one of the few that actually saw Edge of Tomorrow in the cinema back in the day? And if you like this video and you want to see more deep dives into the best VFX of the last 20 years, then please let me know in the comments below, drop a like and subscribe. Otherwise yeah, thank you for watching and have a great day.